One time, uh, don't ask me how, I ended up somewhere I didn't expect. Even being so incredibly young, I was still aware this was a different time and place, where pirates roamed the high seas looking for adventure, treasure, rum. Living a vagabond life anyone would find exciting. I became a part of that adventure and loved every minute. But before I could figure out why this was happening to me, it was over. Like it never happened at all. Then, one day, somehow, I made it back. But things had changed. Musing over a decades-long gap, I began noticing things I hadn't seen before. Flaws in the story, things that didn't hold together or make sense, new faces and worse, new shipmates. I could smell the chlorine and the french fries and see the other people with me, all experiencing it differently, all there for different reasons, all getting something else out of it. I became painfully aware this wasn't my story. It was just the start of my return. <laughs> Return, in this case, has a lot of different meanings. It's a return to a series that hasn't been on its feet since 2009, the Monkey Island point-and-click adventure games, and a return for its original creators, who haven't built a new game for the series since dial-up was in fashion. More than anything, it's a return to an approach for Monkey Island I didn't think I'd see again. The response has been quite extreme, people ranging from really enjoying themselves to feeling totally outraged. And you know, there are things about it I don't think are perfect. It's not my favourite, and it's not going to change the face of the point and click like the original. But what it did instead was make a statement I've been thinking about since it finished. One that seems to have been misconstrued by some as an ending, when if anything, it's a fresh start. Hi, I'm Guybrush Threepwood. Remember me? Guybrush Threepwood, Mighty Pirate, has been on a lot of adventures with his pirate wife Elaine Marley and his arch foe, undead pirate ghost zombie demon LeChuck, Ooh. but sees his focus shift towards something he hasn't pursued for years the secret of Monkey Island. Despite being the title of the very first game, it's not a question that's ever had a concrete answer. So a brand new adventure with a new look has us returning to the place where it all began, to make that official, going back to a lot of the same interactive ideas. It's not a radical reinvention of a point and click, returning, as the title implies, to the kind of gameplay we're readily used to. Not only on this title, but pretty much any point and click. There are some changes, like how the prompts when you hover over items are more like Guybrush's inner monologue, as well as a general streamlining of the interface. Options allow you to pick either casual or more intense difficulties, as well as increased amounts of dialogue, with a hint book on hand if you get really stuck. And these seem to offer the right amount of choice to everyone's preferred style of approach, without compromising on its full potential. Depth of choice in general was a real strength. There were quite a few variables I didn't get to pull off by the time it ended that I know I can go back and uncover, as well as things I chose not to do or could achieve in a different order, and it got me excited about the idea of new point-and-clicks making more of that, Fate of Atlantis style. I think it's still missing the playful nature of the puzzles in the original, with lots of interactive in-the-moment problems that had me reaching for notepads and paying more attention to what characters were doing, an issue I had with the subsequent games as well. This has much less of that and more of what we might call lock and key puzzles, finding one thing that happens to unlock the solution to something else, and often not being terribly difficult. I suspect, however, this may be by design. In fact, the idea of keys and unlocking things is all over this one, including a new character all about giving you the opportunity to do just that, and the leaner difficulty attempting to appeal to an audience that might otherwise be unfamiliar with the series, especially if they find themselves pulled in by the more approachable look, is also entirely purposeful. The feeling from the initial reaction from some was that it was a cheaper, simpler style, which would represent a cheaper, simpler game. I didn't love it myself immediately, but had my suspicions based on the trailer what they were going for, and, having now played it, they've been totally confirmed, with the game immediately diverting my attention to a stylized recap of previous stories. Gilbert wanted something iterative, deliberately choosing the art director of Tearaway, Rex Crowell, a game done in a fantastic papercraft style about creating your own story as you play, there's a handsome devil, and picked him after seeing a piece of fan art Rex created of Guybrush. This essentially capitalizes on the fact that Monkey Island is not a collectively coherent, consistent series. It's bits and pieces of different creators coming together with different ideas, adding new jokes or moments to what has now become not just Ron Gilbert's baby, but a franchise with a life beyond him. Truly, it's a scrapbook. 
so the game just says it out loud. As a story being related from one generation to another, and in a series that has already become a patchwork of different looks, the scrapbook papercraft style suits the message, one people could take to start crafting their own, and it's really, really grown on me. I'd even argue it acts as a hybrid of previous looks to bring everything together in a new way. The blockier, flat aesthetic calls back to the pixel art of the originals, the choice to stylize pulling from Curse's decision, and there are even more moments where the characters move that look more cinematic and three-dimensional, reminiscent of the latter-day attempts. This isn't about establishing a permanent new look for Monkey Island at large. I think this is much more about honouring its existing convention of change and offering meaning to the games that came before retroactively, as if this was always part of the plan. I spent years in therapy getting over being burned, blinded, blown up, abandoned and marooned because of you. <laughs> yeah, good times, huh? There are echoes from those games that carry throughout Return beyond just a feeling. I don't think it's lost on anyone who played the original that the first three acts play out as warped versions of its structure, with the lines beginning to blur in 4 and 5, taking on some of the framing of the second game while mirroring ideas from later titles and beyond. Guybrush starts off revisiting places he's been before, but finds himself thrown by many changes, sometimes adhering to things he thinks might have happened but can't be sure of. I was shocked to see a thread from Escape payoff with Carla now the governor of the island, only to meet Herman Toothrot at the bottom of a cave without any mention of the idea that he might be Elaine's grandfather. To read this as them forgetting would ignore everything they didn't forget. The fact they've picked and chosen whatever bits they like is one clue of many not to take this game entirely literally. There's a number of coincidences in line with the videos I made I found interesting, but one thing I think I'm most pleased about was the choice of bringing back Stan's voice actor from Tales. Honestly, none of the previous voice actors really did it for me, with that probably the only game where I found myself laughing at the delivery alone. I can't get over your jacket. You like it? I just had it in for its annual re-stitching and de-resing. And the same is no different here. Well, sorry to see you in jail. Thank you, son. I appreciate the thought. I'm sorry to see me here as well. I feel he's appropriately positioned in the game's story. You don't want to overwhelm the audience with a character we know so well just because they have that remember me value. But you also want to keep finding ways to top their previous appearances, and the idea of sending him to jail on increasingly absurd sentences definitely did that, as well as this outfit. The same is true of someone else I've come to appreciate, if mostly out of expectation. <laughs> it does help that Murray's dialogue in the last few titles has been more my speed. Danny Delk's a voice you really don't want to waste. There is nothing you can do to diminish my... <laughs> it has the wit I've come to expect from not only Ron, but also Dave Grossman, who I think I've probably sold short when talking about Monkey Island in the past. Dave is a massive part of the point-and-click legacy, with a very particular sense of humour and logic so many games have tried to capture in their own lopsided way. He's had a hand in a huge amount of titles of different stripes in the point-and-click genre, and oversaw a lot of the Telltale revivals as one of its senior staff, apparently very supportive of his teams and making sure they were able to tell their stories on their own terms. I'll admit to worrying about some of the things he said over the years concerning his take on Ron's original intentions, thinking he might try to push back on the risks Gilbert takes to appease a new audience, not knowing the dynamics of who agreed to or created what. But instead, I think he's fostered something equally bold, and I probably owe him an apology for not giving him the credit he likely deserves, especially when Return hits a balance I was hoping for. There's a warmth here, a cozier, relaxed sense of acceptance of Monkey's past, but it hasn't diminished the sad feeling of reality playing at the edge of the frame, or indeed the edge of this paragraph. Ooh. I feel like we're entering a new phase in our relationship. I am trying to contain my joy. That said, I don't think all of this is executed to its best. They've gone for rigged animation, which has the benefit of making these paper cutouts move like shadow puppets, but I'm not sure if the interpolated motion offers the right texture of movement. Personally speaking, I think if a game's going to look like a handmade, crafted thing, you want to feel like it's being animated by hand too, using a dropped frame stop motion style. They do that here or there, and it looks especially good when it happens. And I appreciate there's only so much you can do with the time and resources at your disposal. Still, I think Tearaway figured out a great balance in its animation choices and looked utterly gorgeous throughout, maybe because that game was really going hell for leather in making a point of the look in a 3D space. Apples and oranges, perhaps. Logistics I'm not privy to, and eh, with good reason. Some of the new characters introduced weren't doing a lot for me. I mean, I really like the idea of replacement pirate leaders, a new generation 
generation of villains determined to aggressively modernise the pirate experience. With heavy implications, one of them means more to the story than it's letting on. But outside their designs, they didn't leave much of an impression as standalone personalities. I was also really surprised to see one truly great design not make the cut. This character seemingly swapped out for this one. I'm not sure why. The other seemed to convey the idea they were going for and fit in better with the rest of the crew. I don't... I, I don't know. It, it felt like an odd decision if that's what was going on. Design decisions were hit and miss for me in general. I'm not personally of the opinion that Carla has to be super buff to show she's strong. It didn't feel like an issue before. But I also understand the desire to get more character shape variety in there, given the new look, with most designs absolutely satisfying that. Maybe this will seem uh, blasphemous, but I think, given the game's concept, it would have been weirdly appropriate to actually lean harder on fan service and give those roles to characters like Morgan Le Fay, who gets a mention. This was someone who wanted to be a replacement Guybrush, but was too young to appreciate the reality of his adventures beyond the surface, and casting her in a certain role would have done a lot of conceptual shorthand that might have people twig what the story was trying to tell them, and fold the rest of the series even further into the message. I mean, given some of the characters are supposed to be stand-ins anyway, using existing personalities as they already managed feels like it would have made it a little more of a celebration. A contained mishmash of ideas from across the series under one roof that we don't have to worry about taking as much time to develop, focusing on our key cast story. But then, I don't know if these suggestions would betray what did work for me. I mean, this is it. As a game, I find Return a light and charming experience. But as a piece of living art, I highly respect its principles, the choices it's stuck by to get across its message, and I'm not sure I'd want to see them compromise making their most honest creative statement. We're so much better than you because we don't drink grog before getting married. <laughs> these kids today are all about sacking and pillaging. They've got no heart. After all, I only thought of Lafley's obsession when I realised how it tied into the existing story, something I didn't fully appreciate until the game was finished. I got it was something both Guybrush and LeChuck were going through, but I didn't quite catch how much the game was nudging me towards LeChuck's state of mind in particular. It's worth remembering he has never been explicitly interested in Monkey Island secret like this before. He's had a lot of plans, and most involve trying to marry Elaine, but now he's suddenly demanding to be part of that journey in a really childish way, with his crew ready to mutiny. I don't know if I'm quite sold that his unique presence in this story was fully utilised. A little disappointed to not see another transformation, to carry on a now long-running joke, and I don't know if after the passing of Earl Bowen, that Jess Harnell, who I love, was the best choice. Some say it's Grom that keeps a pirate ship running. It's not! It's paperwork! When JB Blanc is right there. That's probably safest if you don't sleep at all. The chickens have their ways. He was in Breaking Bad. He fixed Gus Spring and Mike. Sorry, I think I've lost the thread somewhere here. But I do like how he now mirrors Guybrush in his obsession, something tantalisingly touched on in other Ron and Dave games, serving to emphasise Guybrush's own faults. Guy's characterization is closer to the second game, where, as this comment points out, he acted less like a romanticised pirate and more like a cheeky kid, committing sociopathic actions to get what he wanted, and seeing shades of that in both characters again suggested more was at play. And they're not the only ones I was getting vibes from. Elaine herself was a lesser presence, and I was worried this was squandering her potential. She was off being part of what felt like some wacky joke, parodying real-world issues, Monkey Island being a funny pirate game series some fans don't want me to anticipate anticipate anything else from. As far as many are concerned, this is just a cute pirate marriage, in spite of Gilbert saying he never intended for their relationship to work out, that there were other things going on which were never revealed, and I thought, ah well, I guess this is just where we are now. You can read up some of this in the uh, Monkey Island Chronicles that came from the limited run edition, uh, uh, which I suppose, well, isn't around anymore. But I did think it was a strange move for them to attribute the criticism of this to Tales, when really it applies to Curse, but I sense there was a reason. There there wasn't a lot of Tales material in this one. Probably would have done it if they could have. I thought maybe the game was resting on that notion, not wanting to rock the boat and continue the thread where they were on the outs in revenge. Only something felt off. Elaine's short appearances seemed more deliberate than I gave credit for, and thinking back on them had me stop myself. Was it just a charitable dream to end scurvy, or was this someone moving on to something bigger, a more important cause? Does she not show up as much because the developers forgot, or because she already knows the secret, and doesn't feel the need to intervene? She says a seagull ripped this picture of her and Guybrush in half, and I accepted that but I thought it was interesting they wanted me to see that without context first, clearly to evoke a reaction. This used to be a picture of both of us. What happened to the me part? 
She's nice, sweet, and affectionate, but never intimate. Honestly, I got the sense I was being tolerated. More than any other game, Elaine in this one comes across less as a partner and more as a caregiver, perhaps to fit in with Ron's original plans without speaking up and ruining many players' perception of her, and at the very end suddenly appearing to assess Guy's progress and asking if how much of what I did was necessary. I assumed this game was just full of japes and cheeky banter. I didn't realize I was going to get called out like this. Remind me why we're talking about all this? It's just... I'm worried that the secret can't possibly measure up to the effort and anticipation. What exactly are you expecting to find? Maybe I should, because it's happened multiple times. There were constant allusions to the idea of endless obsessions, self-destructive habits, stories that continue forever and ever, cryptic comments designed to unnerve me. If you listen close, you can hear the gears grinding. The jokes in Monkey Island are funny, but they can also be more impactful when you realize that, like in the first two titles, sometimes they're not just jokes. And soon you're wondering if maybe you're missing the point. Maybe it's messing with your head and asking something more of you. Maybe it's talking directly about you. A guy runs a pirate museum packed with stuff from the other games and offers his own interpretations on what everything means, posing as an expert when he's not the original storyteller. Guybrush getting mad about everything being reinterpreted incorrectly. And hang on, hang on, <laughs> this is getting kind of personal. Pretty wild story. I'm telling you the truth. I'm sure you are, but it just doesn't quite square with the official record so it's hard to substantiate. For the first time in years, the creepy sense I was being messed with was back. The further I pushed on, the more my actions wrought destruction upon the fabric of the fiction, peeling back the layers of narrative I thought I was protecting. The island was becoming more and more dilapidated, dark magic the new language of choice, leaving the poor voodoo lady feeling undervalued enough to casually throw in her real name. Somehow it was more exciting before I knew that. That is true of many things. This wasn't just about a secret anymore. This was about something else, and I felt that really started to chase me as I ran towards a supposed confrontation against my sworn archenemy in the depths of Monkey Island, the artifice starting to poke through the holes, the narrative collapsing, and a final puzzle I recognized, and if I can just, if, if you just give me a chance to go and- uh, Oh no. Not yet. I think we can't talk about the ending without mentioning the beginning. The real beginning. Ron Gilbert based Monkey Island on his experience as a child going through Disneyland's famous ride, Pirates of the Caribbean, finding himself immersed in its world and deciding to make a game that recreated that experience. The second title, LeChuck's Revenge, has a curious twist ending that ties into that influence. Your mother and I were very concerned. Thank you for hunting down your brother like we asked, Chucky dear. It implies everything was a lie. LeChuck and Guybrush actually children in a theme park play fighting, quoting Empire Strikes Back. Or maybe they're not. It's left unclear. Ron never got to make a third game, leaving LucasArts and seeing it passed over to another team that went a different way. Making out the ending of two was probably a magic hallucination after all, and the series continued without him, outside of some light consultation on Tales. Ron claimed his original intentions, however, weren't properly revealed, and in a manifesto he put out on his blog, he explained if he ever got the chance to make another game in the series, he would make his original take for the third title, and act as though the sequels mostly never happened beginning where that game ended. In a theme park. <laughs> What's next? Let's goof on those two. Pretend they're our parents. Now, Return does that last part, but not in a way you would have expected, immediately subverted by another huge twist. Hey, Dad. Hello, Mr. Threepwood. Hey, kids. Having fun? You'd be forgiven for seeing this as a retcon and going, okay, he's undoing the idea of it being a lie. This is the real truth. Here we go. But there's already plenty of conflicting information. Is it an accident these kids happen to look like Monkey Island characters? Why is the scenery changing bit by bit? Is this really a father talking to his son? Or a younger reflection, an unreliable narrator living in his unreliable narrative? That unreliability and sense of unease is at play throughout, with conversations having double meanings, characters not quite connecting in ways that feel deliberate, jokes that aren't just jokes. Everything you played before this was canon, or maybe it wasn't. But if you enjoyed those tales, does it actually matter? To take the story presented at face value, to not question that from the beginning things aren't what they appear, is to misunderstand the purpose of Return. Ron Gilbert accepted he would never get to make the game he originally wanted. Regardless of his intentions, the later games had found their fans, and many had already covered ideas he wanted to explore in one way or another, feeling it would be reductive to the franchise as a whole to deny them any validation, to usurp them when so much had changed. 
I finally took the hint that his previous comeback project, Thimbleweed Park, was a way to work out those frustrations from the manifesto on something he had full control over. He clearly wanted to make a game with tough puzzles, an even more uncompromising ending, and in the graphical style of his early works, but probably figured out not only was it better not to save that for something he might never get to, but also not to lock Monkey Island into something it isn't any longer. And so, the start of the solution here was to make the ending of Return a chance to set the record straight, to just tell us the secret. And man, man oh man, I was right. Glad you finally made it, kid. What, Stan? It's closing time and everyone wants to go home. This is not up for debate. The final room is explicitly what Gilbert had planned since the start. A shrine to the secret, and all the ideas it might have presented. Maybe with someone as a theme park owner, maybe with Guybrush as a child or flooring inspector, or maybe just whatever was in this chest. I know there's been conflicting information. I know there was at one point an early document that said it was a portal to hell, and Stan is there, and that how two sending took shape was late in the process. But this secret was one of the key influences that predates both iterations. What is Monkey Island if not the fantasies of Ron Gilbert inspired by a theme park? which we now have on record. You know, Guybrush being in an amusement park, that is the secret. That's what it was, you know, back in 1989 when I was putting all this together. My greatest appreciation above all is that it's an actual room. In Monkey 2, the player lost all agency to the narrative at this point. I couldn't stay inside this new reality for long. My little brother Chucky was telling me how to react, and my parents took me away before I could understand what I'd done. And that was right for the effect they were trying to get across. Here, I can take my time. Stan gives the keys over so I can make my decisions, while Elaine patiently waits at the exit. But at some point, I have to turn out the lights, one by one, close everything down, and go home. I can't think of a better way to end. Except there are other ways. The player has a variety of options at their disposal here, which allows them to take on different endings, up to and including going back downstairs through the door of Monkey Island's reality, allowing you to ignore anything you saw. Otherwise it ends with the framing device of Guybrush telling a story, offering several options for you to select and decide what you felt the secret really was. Ron claims he doesn't want to confirm his choice so as to not take away the player's final interpretation, but you can imagine which ending sounds like the one that expresses his thoughts the most. There isn't any one answer to what the secret is. It's not like a rock or a banana. It's like a story. It changes with time. And the person telling it. Everyone you ask will have a different idea. The whole thing now reads as an allegory for Ron's experience with his flagship series and the fans who were so desperate to know the truth. You feel him enjoy the process of creating it, gearing up for a climax, but cut off at the last minute, running out of time to finish his story and left dangling in the hope he could one day return. Not yet. He'd obsessed over that possibility, and many of us obsessed with finding out the truth, judging if the other games held up to its mysterious standard. But the more time went on, the higher expectations got, meaning nothing could truly live up to the promise, and the more it only hurt the work done by him and others as they were all pitted against each other. So the stories changed. This room represents what the secret was, but not what it is any longer. The game's wraparound framing device, now the real reward, no longer beholden to one person's take. It's why I wasn't bothered that there wasn't a final confrontation, because every version of it in my head seemed inevitably played out. Guybrush and LeChuck's confrontation didn't end because it never ends. It keeps coming back in different ways and different flavors whenever someone else decides to continue the story again, and doubtless that will continue. The story instead satisfied everything it needed to say with its characters about destructively chasing obsessions, with no thought for the consequences or whether or not the outcome would match that intensity. There'd be no way to express that effectively without an abrupt cutoff. The characters forced, like us and Ron, to let go of an obsession with the truth. Yes, one legend has come to an end, but enough time has been spent chasing it, when so many more can now be told. I thought it was perfect, and even better, totally rehabilitated the games he didn't make in my eyes. Anything you don't like, you can now read as the product of someone who loves telling tall tales. You can take Curse as the totally literal explanation of everything, or you can take it as another of Guybrush's fantasies as he backpedals through the divisive ending of Game 2. You can take Escape literally as making the secret a giant monkey robot, or you can take it as someone desperately trying to make it sound more exciting. You can take any and every sign in those stories as part of the same unreliable narrative. And most importantly, you can do the same with any future stories. Ron created an ending that doesn't invalidate anything that came before, while also allowing the series to carry on, showing canon can't constrain the raw malleability of fiction. 
how stories can be resolved on whatever terms we decide, existing through what is now layers of narrative that protect whatever viewpoint the listener chooses. This idea of expansive choice, as presented in a point and click, it's the kind of commentary I know I can only get with Gilbert, and the generosity of meaning doesn't even stop there. Wait. What's this? This letter from Dave and Ron is, for the first time, an admittance of everything they set out to achieve with each Monkey Island game they were involved with. They confirmed things I was guessing at with 2's development, so that was cathartic. They also confirmed things I never knew about Tales, which explains why I responded to it more than I expected. But most of all, they confirmed their purpose with the entire series after years and years of keeping quiet. Two legendary developers finally getting their innermost thoughts off their chest. Thoughts. I took to be secret. What was also interesting, however, was the other side of that reaction. Uh, here we go. Overall, the response has been fine. The critical scores and ratings were good, the sales were good, and there's no reason Disney, who currently holds the IP, wouldn't want to make future games based on how well it's done, already extending the license as we speak. Ron has said he's not opposed to coming back, but even if he doesn't, Return has squared the debt he feels was owed and ensures more can be made. He got to say what he wanted without closing the door on the series. There's no bad ending here. However, there were also people who reacted very, very badly to both the way the game looked and how it ended. Some felt it was a cop-out, telling a story he wasn't actually interested in resolving, and then wimping out on a conclusion with a meta ending, something he's been accused of twice before. They called it cheap, they called it lazy, they called it unsatisfying, but I think the strongest accusation came from the Zero Punctuation review. Now, that show has ended, and Yahtzee's always been famously flippant, but I don't think that minimizes the traction still maintained by this damning take he gave on its end. There is enough humour and imagination on display to make one recommend it, in which case allow me to explain why I don't. Ooh, twist in the testicles there! It's the ending. Again. They're clearly making a deliberate statement with it, it's just that I interpret that statement as follows. Oh, have you actually invested mental energy into all these intrigues and relationships you've spent the last few hours building up and are expecting a payoff to all that? Puh! Talk about missing the point. What a sad lame you must be. The end. Haven't these games always been about where we were as creators? Oh, okay. So you're saying the final message of Return to Monkey Island is, we've stopped giving a shit and so should you. Message received! I have to say, as someone who thinks Yahtzee often has a point, I find this a particularly twisted reading of the message, and given so many people have started parroting this thought as their own, I feel it's a sentiment worth exploring. A few years back, when I made my first video on the subject, I spoke on how I'd always been a fan of the later games, doubled back to binge play the whole series in order, and realised I now preferred the originals. I appreciated and enjoyed the fun and innovation of the first, and was caught off guard by the incredible feeling of the second, introducing a subtle commentary that recontextualised both games as a discussion on Gilbert's relationship with his childhood influences which I now saw had been there since the beginning. It was harder to enjoy the games made after he left as a result, which did carry over elements of what he came up with, but were less concerned with exploring them fully, or maybe in hindsight, worried about treading on his interpretation, and pivoted instead to being literal, silly, funny games without much else to say. That's no bad thing on its own, but I now understood why those were often bemoaned as not standing up to Ron's vision, and I decided to lay that argument out in a way I hadn't seen people properly do yet, being kinda flippant about my fairly raw feelings on Curse in that context. But it's so overextended, so impossible to connect, and devoid of decent punchlines beyond hey isn't Monkey Island so kooky, that it's neither funny nor exciting. It's just a lot of noise. A bit like me. I got my head bitten off. Times had changed. Curse had gone from being the black sheep of the herd to many people's introduction to the series, and one of their favourite games. And while there were people who liked what I had to say, some revealed a growing anti-Ron sentiment I didn't know was out there. For every couple of nice comments was one pedantically or angrily telling me I was wrong, that actually Gilbert's original vision was bad, or that they didn't want the series to be a meta-narrative, or that I was just wrong, and the theme park ending was never real. There's no proof. It's not that deep, bro. And I thought, hmm. What have I gotten myself into? So, when a new trailer for a Monkey Island game by Ron Gilbert was announced, and everyone started jumping for joy, I said, hey, this might not be what you want. It might not be a third game tying up loose ends, it might not be a wacky pirate adventure, it might expand on this theme park thing. Sadly, it meant it didn't surprise me when the anger turned from me to Ron, first when the next trailer dropped, sparking a bluntly aggressive turn on the art direction, and forcing Ron to shut down comments on a blog he'd run just fine for years. If you think this was ignoring quote, valid 
criticism. Uh, you weren't reading the intonation of these things. I got sent some too. There's no way you'd say it like this to anyone's face. But it was the ending that really kicked that into total division, interpreted as telling us to move on because fiction isn't as worth investing in as reality. The reaction is all very interesting to me. I think a lot of people have forgotten how this really did happen to Curse as well, seen as pandering to a younger crowd through what was a then-popular look, a take that has obviously completely changed. In a way, history repeating itself has brought Ron in return back into the franchise perfectly. For years, his hypothetical third game a stick to beat off Curse with. As this review put it, a positive one I might add, Ron Gilbert can finally take his place among the frauds who betrayed the vision of Ron Gilbert. Really, I think a lot of these takes were totally mischaracterizing the intention, and seem to be coming from people who've never been willing to grapple with the secret to begin with. Why are they doing this ending again? Because you didn't believe them the first time. I tried to warn you, truly. And it's funny so many people wanted to vent about how wrong I was to suggest the first and second games were specifically pointing to Monkey Island actually being a theme park, when I think the evidence I laid out was pretty clear. Guess I screwed up by just showing the comparisons on screen and being coy in the dialogue, hoping the audience would put two and two together. So I'll just like, uh, I'll, I'll just spell them out, shall I? This feels like a break room backstage. This feels like turning off an artificial water supply. This is the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, as it appears in the Disneyland poster. Carla gives you a t-shirt, like a carnival prize. This is an actual circus. This is a vending machine, which later appears in a series of tunnels designed after the Disney parks. This is George Lucas in what's effectively a theme park costume. This is another person in what's effectively a theme park costume. These feel like a bunch of sideshow attractions and gift shops, with people who seem more like park workers than pirates. Always amazing to me that people try to characterize Kate Capsize as a brave pirate, when her demeanor screams bored and underpaid intern. Three hour tours. This is a conversation in the middle of the game about Guybrush perhaps being a child who's lost his parents, meaning the ending is foreshadowed rather than something which comes out of nowhere. Dog? dog. We can take this to the sequels too. This is the entrance to Pirates of the Caribbean in Florida. This is a quick service restaurant, and a lot of themed recreational spots, discounting whatever you want to make of its separation from the actual theme park. This was the layout of Downtown Disney, in a story about a corporate newcomer taking control of the islands. This is the turnstile from the ride, and this is the sound of a roller coaster. You're picking these up this time, right? Even the later titles honored what they saw running through the originals. Not just funny anachronisms, but all sensing the truth even if they didn't want to bring it forward. Maybe themselves hoping Ron might find a way to answer the hard questions himself later on. Return isn't betraying anything that wasn't already on the table. Although given some of the reactions my video got, I thought, eh, maybe I'm reaching here. Until this happened. There was a, a somewhat popular video on YouTube once, and the way it, it described the first two Monkey Island games were that Secret of Monkey Island is like you're on the ride and Monkey 2 sort of feels like you get off the ride and you walk into the back and you see the animatronics from behind and like mm -hmm. the, the, the tone the tone sort of changes slightly. Do you agree with that or not? Yeah, that, that's probably true. You know, there was a whole thing about Guybrushes in an amusement park, right? That was a thing. That was that was in that game, and you know, I, I kind of lost that in terms of the uh, of the main story. And you can still see little odds and ends in the first game, where we're calling to back that maybe this is an amusement park. But by the time the second game happened, I, w I was a little more intent to kind of have that be a little a little more in in the forefront. <laughs> no wonder I have trust issues. But re-establishing that truth, as mentioned before, is ironically to tell you it's no longer the last word on the matter, and why I feel the dismissal seems counterintuitive. I can accept if you simply don't like it. I didn't think it was necessarily the best in the franchise or a real knee slapper. I felt some of the gameplay was a bit lighter than I would have liked, even if I get most of this was intended. I also get if you just want a self-contained pirate adventure, and I can't say you're wrong to want one either. I bloody love the Pirates of the Caribbean films. I quote them all the time. Fish fish people. See? Fish people. I'm not against escapism. They're great precisely because they are what they say they are. The flip side of the source. Though the third one does almost, uh, well no, no <laughs> let's not get into that. But the idea of it attacking people for being invested is just wrong. You're the one who said you can't just change things. You said that's not how storytelling works. I did? I want to know the secret! The message is so patently about the obsession with Ron's secret specifically, his original secret, that letting go of that is the only way for the story to adapt and change. Because let's face it, people at large would rather have their own answer. 
Even this interviewer, who likes this game, hears Ron pretty much spell out the ending and its meaning, and instead chooses to accept the fiction. Well, which, which, which one in your mind is canon? The one, well, the one I chose was that he uh, told his child um, that this is exactly how this happened. But here's the thing. The game was designed for her to be able to do so. This is not telling us to give up and grow up, or that the developers don't care. It's telling us these stories with engaging characters have developed far beyond those original intentions, freed from the concept of canon. Not because Ron or Dave don't have an ending, but because they want there to be more stories to tell for whoever wants to tell them. This isn't selfishness. This is generosity, allowing all the games to represent a notion that was always there, but never spoken, to encourage us to keep investing and creating and storytelling within and without the series. And I'm pretty sure I'm as right about that as I was about, you know, the secret. There is no canon um, here. It belongs to you. Um, how do you like that? I think some people, you know, sort of don't, they just want to be told what's going on. They, they're uncomfortable with that responsibility, but that's our story and that's the end of it is 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 open-ended by by design i know i'm not likely to change hearts and minds you may feel i'm just being a pretentious idiot hey you might be right but i can't uncare about how i resonated with this solution if i can potentially get people to understand why i or anyone might like this then at least that's enough for me though i think the majority of players did for all the angry comments there are plenty of people who've talked about how they were equally moved who felt it was saying something more to them, whether they were new fans or people coming back to reflect on the past. Really, the best thing is how content Ron seems. Yeah, he saw at some of the reaction and took it to heart enough to pull back, but he still stands by his work and is clearly very proud of what they've achieved. I think with this with with this Monkey Island, with Return of Monkey Island, it kind of was about that. It's like, okay, well, we have something new and interesting to say, and so it made it worth doing. And you know, I don't want to do Yahtzee dirty either. I actually think he's had some very salient points as of late, and has decent ones about return and point and clicks too. But when looking at his take on the ending, and the way certain people have propped it up, many of them not in line with his takes on revenge and curse, I have to wonder if he wasn't over-egging even his own pudding. I know he's not against Monkey Island having a subversive double meaning. Not when I know he said this. Monkey Island 2 was tight enough to stand alone as a classic, and even attempted to end in a way that would ensure no more sequels. But okay, it was a bit sad, but some stories need sad endings. Would Romeo and Juliet have been greatly improved by a sequel where they both spring to life and go on a motorcycle tour of the Mediterranean? I guess the real beef was in Monkey Island coming back at all. And you know, it's his prerogative. I wonder what he'd say to all this. I don't know. Probably something like, fuck this, fuck you, and fuck me. The final question, of course, is why I was so stuck on my interpretation. Some people ask why I like the twist of two. Why it's not enough for me that it's just a pirate adventure. Don't I find the double meaning cynical or pretentious or anticlimactic? Don't I find it insincere for a character to turn and point at me and say, this is a video game, stop caring and go live your life, loser? Well, no. Because that's not what I feel was being said at all. I find the idea of Monkey Island being allegorical, rather than literal, incredibly thrilling because of what it suggests about why the story is being told at all. What else there is to uncover about that meaning? How something that isn't real can still matter. How I can decide what it means to me. I know people think Ron's twist endings are a hack move done to avoid actually resolving his plot lines, having done an everything you knew was a lie ending three times now, but to characterize those all as being the same is to ignore how they made me feel, why I'm still thinking about them. Spoilers, obviously. Monkey 2's ending is laid throughout. It challenges the player to think about the first game differently, how it must feel for people to have to live up to unplanned success, to tell a bigger and better story. A pressured Guybrush now acts more like an insecure ass, slowly watching the persona he created fall apart as reality collapses around him, his self-image finally ruined. It's nihilistic in that it doesn't leave our characters in a satisfying place, but exhilarating in how it recontextualized the experience and started a whole new conversation about what this series could really be saying. Thimbleweed Park isn't free of clues to the true nature of its ending either, with Gilbert stating there's a lot of hidden meanings signifying the twist where the characters are told they've been part of a video game, and that they have to drop everything and turn it off. Largely inspired by Twin Peaks and The X-Files, it's in keeping with the subversive tone, but it's not a rejection of what you've become attached to. The characters, when told the truth, don't change their outlook. They still want to accomplish the things they set out to do and reject the revelation, but then it's up to the player to either attempt to complete those tasks and try to to give them the closure you think they deserve, or go straight to the end, asking if, even knowing the truth, those characters matter enough to want to save them. Tragic, but far from lazy. And this is why Return's ending is so life-affirming to me. 
Because, compared to those, it's not scary or depressing. It's letting you know things do go on, for them, for everyone. We can lose sight of our actions in pursuit of what we love, but letting go doesn't mean the story ends, only that it changes. And it tells us that over and over. Through the choices, the style, the unreliable use and non-use of canon, the multiple endings, it's a big Rorschach test, an extremely flexible narrative for the player to decide its meaning. Those choices telling on yourself may be more than the developers. I certainly learned things about myself, that for as cathartic and wonderful as it was to be right about the secret, I still felt hollow, that I'd rushed through the game as greedily as Guybrush simply to get validation I can't do anything with, other than maybe piss some people off. But past the secret was a worthwhile message, that there was a reason I was interested in the secret to begin with, that I don't have to think of fiction in one specific way. And with the pretense dropped, the end of one story revealed the path to tell so many more. Maybe even better ones. I found the lost map to the treasure of Maya Island. It's going to be a fun adventure. I'll meet you down there. I was speaking to Jake Rodkin, a key developer on Tales, who was explaining what it was like having to create another piece of the puzzle, that even with Ron and Dave's guidance, they were still in the dark as to what it was all supposed to mean. But having also loved Return, he felt what it accomplished was to reaffirm its appeal, one that drew other creators to want to tell the story, that even with the truth out there, there was still hidden meaning waiting to be found. A secret, recognizing the hints of truth beneath the surface, wanting to dig deeper and discover the buried treasure, and in its pursuit, creating new legendary stories that inspired others to seek their own secrets, ones that make the original look small. Sure, we can get lost in the fiction and attack those who don't accept our view, but that doesn't restrict the potential of any story, able to change and mean something else to whoever wishes to listen as our own understanding of what's possible evolves, learning to let go to expand our imagination, rather than limit it. It's incredibly fitting. Pirates, after all, were master mythmakers, exaggerating their personas and stories, stretching a mundane truth to inspire the spirit of adventure in all of us and keep their legends alive. Return is the embodiment of that principle, propelling the myth even further, challenging the restrictions of truth against what it's already been to so many, no matter if it was real or all in the mind of a theme park's flooring inspector. It only occurred to me, as I started my last ride through of the holiday, what had happened. I was sitting on Pirates of the Caribbean, I was pushing 30, and in a week, Ron Gilbert's new Monkey Island game would come out. 30 years after the original, my life spanned the influence of its existence, and I was sitting on the pioneer version of the thing that sparked it, seeing it in an entirely new way with my tired adult brain. Thinking about the people who made this, how well they made it, how well Ron's game captured the feel of it, and how even knowing everything about the way it was created and what it really was, that I was still excited to be part of the ride, and how else it might be adapted in the future. It was different to how I felt as a kid, and yet I was also satisfied. Satisfied I'd got to have my moment to experience it myself. I'd changed so much, but this thing still thrilled me, and the possibility of what else it might inspire, what it might inspire anyone with me here to do, was something else. And I thought, wow. I wonder what's next. Thanks for watching everyone! If you made it this far, I'd like to thank my patrons for their ever-generous spirit and patience for a video that was really a long time coming. Sticking to the theme of unfinished business, I guess, but you know, kinda wanted some extra time to just not think about it and the noise around it. Probably for the best? <laughs> their support is what keeps all this going, so if you'd like to join one of these names, then you can click on the links. I would also like to give a shout to the few great folks who helped out. Jake Rodkin and Maya Swinter of the former Telltale Games, who both provided details and thoughts that I mentioned here. 
and the Noclip documentary on the making of Return, which is really good and explains everything in such a neat and excellent way. High quality stuff, and can't believe it came out in the same month that I was putting this together, but you know, just great minds thinking alike, glad they got to do it first, you know? <laughs> That's it from me, thanks again, and don't look behind you, it's a three-headed monkey. I, see, I, I love video game. To be honest, those fish people creep me out.